Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is wildlife competition, fighting for survival. And it will be presented by wildlife biologist, Aaron Bott. Aaron, thank you again for being here and presenting to us today. Let's go ahead and dive in. Thank you. And thank you everyone for tuning in. This is an exciting topic and I hope that we'll walk away with some uh, better appreciation of life and the complexity of coexistence. Um, yeah, let's dive right into it. By way of introduction, I'm a wildlife biologist. My name is Aaron Bott and I work in the American West where I study primarily carnivores, mostly wolves. Um, I've been working out here for a long time. I grew up in the American West, where my family's been for the last six generations. Uh, so I've got a deep sentimental attachment to this part of the world. And fortunately, I've had the opportunity to work with some incredible species, everything from beavers and muskrats up to bison and grizzly bears. And uh, like I said, mostly wolves. Um, I did a lot of graduate research in Yellowstone National Park and uh, continued to work around the park area and in the Yellowstone country where I grew up for a number of years. Again, mostly monitoring large carnivore populations. And uh, last week I gave a presentation on predation. And predation really is just a form of competition, which is what we're going to be talking about today. This is a really broad subject, so my purpose is just to make a brief introduction regarding what competition is in the natural world, specifically with some of those animals that we're most interested in. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, how we define competition and how it can impact populations. Um, you can't have competition solely impacting an individual without there generally be, being some kind of repercussions to the population at large. And typically most enduring competition takes place at a population level. So we'll talk a little bit about this population ecology as we call it. And uh, then we'll talk a little bit more specifically about behavioral ecology, um, something that we call ethology, which I'm going to be presenting more on next week. Um, my specialty is more along the lines of animal behavior and ethology. Um, but the two subjects, population ecology and then wildlife or animal behavior kind of work hand in hand together. So it, it's most advantageous to us today to talk a little bit about the broad population ecology and competition, and then get down into some details, specifically talking about um, behavioral ecology and how animals respond to different kinds of competition. So what is competition? Well, firstly, I think it's important for us to realize that in the natural world, there's no such thing as uh, one species versus another species um, without there being some kind of external forces at work. Uh, there's no such thing as uh, a vacuum or a laboratory where we're simply looking at how one predatory species impacts another species survival and reproduction or even how two of the same species, something we call uh, conspecific or intraspecific competition can um, be at play without taking into consideration the larger environment and the ecosystem as a whole. So because I work with large carnivores, one of the most common questions I get asked is how many elk can a wolf eat in a year or how many elk are killed by wolves every year? And that is Undoubtedly, one of the most popular questions, and I kind of touched on this last week, but it's really perhaps the most complex of the questions to ask, because there's a whole lot of variability and factors at play which can influence the predation rate and the kill rate of wolves versus elk 
depending on the environment, depending on the health of your wolf population, the abundance of your wolf population, the health of your elk population, its abundance, um, how many other different animals might be on the menu uh, that wolves could choose from, and again, getting into more and more the weeds of just how complex competition, and in this case, predation of wolves upon elk can truly be. So we might study one environment very thoroughly, but really we can never come up with all of the, the variables and take them into consideration. We just do our best to try and model and figure out what the greatest likelihood is bound to be. But in many cases, we have to be careful of applying these results to um, global scales. We have to kind of take each population into consideration and uh, also take each environment into consideration as well. So again, my takeaway is that no organism lives in a vacuum. No organism lives alone. Uh, organisms grow and they reproduce and they die. That's kind of the life cycle of all of us, right? Um, and we're affected by the conditions in which we live and by the resources that we have access to. Uh, that drives us individually and that also drives us as a population. But again, none of us live in a vacuum. We all have to, to some degree, compete with other species or with one another. So to begin, I'm gonna talk about intraspecific competition. Intraspecific competition is same species competition. So we as humans compete with one another for resources. An elk herd competes with other elk for resources. And I think this is a really good starting place to talk about competition um, because the same species generally have the same requirements for survival, growth, and reproduction. Those three um, important factors in our existence, our ontology, um, ontogeny, excuse me, as we call it. Um, so how is it that we can coexist and yet we have to compete with other members of our own species that essentially need the same resources that we need? And this can be a little bit confusing and complex because uh, we are sharing the same environment as other members of our species, and we are all trying to extract and take advantage of resources that will benefit us individually with the understanding that these resources also have to support other members of our species, our, our neighbors, um, and there's generally a limitation to how many resources are available to support one population. So there are two key components of this kind of uh, competition. And the first one is an indirect form of competition known as exploitation, where we see resource levels declining as population density increases, which I think is a, a pretty... Um, no-brainer. I think that we can all kind of understand that populations are generally limited by the available resources. I often like to kind of make an imaginary um, analogy of a room full of people with pizza. So it's a pizza party. You've got a pizza with eight slices in it. Uh, if there's only four people in the room, then everyone gets full by each having two pieces of pizza and we feel better for it. And um, we maybe had such a good time at the party and we, we really raved about how good the pepperoni pizza was that we go out and we tell all of our friends about just how awesome that pepperoni pizza party was and we encourage our friends to come and join us at the next pizza party. So we have recruitment. And the next time we all get together, perhaps we, increased our population in the room by 100%. So now we have eight people in the room and uh, one pepperoni pizza with eight slices. Now this time everyone just gets one slice of pizza. So we're still a little bit hungry afterwards, but everyone is nevertheless satisfied and we all 
talk about just how enjoyable the pepperoni pizza party was. And so we go out and we start to invite other friends and tell them about just how good that pepperoni pizza was. And the following time we get together, the next pepperoni pizza party we have, we have 16 people who arrive at the pepperoni pizza party. And with only one pizza, eight slices, that means that everyone only gets a half a slice of pizza. Um, our resources are becoming scarce. And in becoming scarce, um, people begin to question whether the pizza party is actually that fun or not. Um, it, it was good pizza for sure, but there wasn't enough to go around. And so we stop advertising just how good the pizza party is. Our recruitment rate um, decreases. We're no longer going out and marketing just how awesome the party was. And in fact, not only that, but our survival rates also decrease because people who were invited to the pizza party now are kind of uh, dissatisfied with it and they start to, um, to dissolve and to leave and they don't come back. And so the population uh, drops. So this is kind of my silly little um, metaphor of what population carrying capacities and competition is, is all about. So we have resources, but resources are generally limited. And in the real world, we have recruitment rates, which are generally bound up with fertility and reproduction. So if resources are readily available to individuals in a population, then the fecundity and the reproductive rate and therefore the recruitment rate of the population increases. And the healthier your pregnant females are, for example, the higher the chance, they're the greater likelihood of, of your offspring survival is going to be and your recruitment rates increase. But as the population begins to outgrow um, its resources, then ultimately the population starts to decline. So that's exploitation, uh, which is generally indirect competition with other individuals of the same species. But we also have interference competition. And this image of two bighorn sheep smashing their heads together during the rut, during the breeding season, for reproductive rights is a perfect example of interference competition. Uh, interference competition is when individuals interact directly with one another, preventing one another from exploiting the resources within a portion of the habitat. So in the case of these bighorn sheep, they are struggling to have a dominant breeding opportunity over a harem of ewes of female bighorn sheep. Um, they're polygynous individual or the polygynous species and so the males generally will have a harem of females and after uh, demonstrating his prowess as a male, his strength, um, kind of this physical manifestation of his genetic integrity, uh, he then has access to breed with all the females in his harem and he passes along his genes. And he, the winner, is getting in the way. He's interfering with all of the other males in the population who also are striving to be breeders. Um, I think this is probably the, the best direct example of uh, inter, or excuse me, intraspecific competition interference. Um, but we also have other um, uh, examples of this, uh, such as. Um, how many lions a, a zebra kill are capable of sitting down and actually consuming enough meat um, to not only help with the rearing of their offspring, but also are capable of supporting um, themselves individualistically. So this is a great, again, form of interference competition that we often see in the animal kingdom. And it's important to realize that while exploitation and interference can be separate in terms of competition, very often they overlap. Very often you have exploitation and interference competition taking place at the same time. My example of lions eating at a kill kind of 
uh, illustrates that. So you have exploitation where indirectly the lions are all sitting around at the dinner table. They're not fighting with one another in my fictitious example, um, but they are at the same time interfering with one another's own meal portion by uh, trying to eat as much as they possibly can um, before they get left out, before they go hungry when the food runs out. So we, we tend to kind of have this binary example of interference competition and exploitation competition, but again, it's important to realize that a lot of times these overlap. And then we get into what's called density dependence and carrying capacities. And these might be more familiar with you, but density dependence is a, is a term that we use in ecology, which basically is a reflection of crowding. Um, we talk about density dependence on a landscape or in a population, or perhaps even in a lion pride or in a wolf pack, where there's only so much room before people or before animals start to feel overcrowded and there is not enough resources to go around. And this kind of ties in very closely with what's known as a carrying capacity. And I've stuck up this um, logistic. Uh, graph here and our Lotko Volterra equation, which is uh, really more complex than we need to get into today, but I think it's a pretty good illustration of population growth over time based on available resources and competition. Um, so you have there on the x axis time, and then you have population growth on the y axis. And K, that letter K there is representing your carrying capacity. Um, so in theory, at some point in time, there are only so many resources available to go around to your population. And as your resources become more limited, your recruitment rates start to decrease. Um, your fecundity, your reproduction levels start to decrease. Um, because individuals have less uh, individualistic benefits and they also have um, more mortality in the population to offset recruitment as well as more individuals um, die from natural causes and also from uh, they have lower survival rates because of less nutritional value perhaps that they're getting out of their resources. The population tends to stabilize at this uh, theoretical carrying capacity. So we have this sigmoidal curve on our graph um, compared to exponential growth, that straight line on the left-hand side. And uh, again, this illustrates that at a carrying capacity, we basically have only so many resources on the landscape to support a certain population. There is what we call density dependence. Crowding eventually takes place and dictates just how many individuals can, can live on the landscape. Now, this is pretty simple to understand, um, hopefully, if I explained it simply enough. But it's also important to realize that this theory of carrying capacity, while exhibited in nature, is never as simplistic as this graph shows. Um, carrying capacities have a lot of variation in them, and they can be pretty. Um, almost, I would say, erratic at times, because there's a whole lot of variables that influence the resources as well as the population that we're observing. So as resources fluctuate based off of a whole wide variety of factors, the carrying capacity itself can have um, volatile movement going up and down at times. So it's never quite as static as this graph demonstrates here. Um, it's also important to realize that not all individuals in the population might suffer from density dependence or the carrying capacity threshold. So, for example, if you have um, a bunch of aphids on a tree branch, um, you might have a very high concentration of aphids just on a few leaves of that branch. And some of the more distal leaves on that branch might have very few aphids. And so the carrying capacity has theoretically been reached, 
but not all the aphids are going to suffer the repercussions of having reached carrying capacity. Now we can get into interspecific competition, which is where different species compete for resources, ultimately influencing survival, growth, and reproduction. Um, this is something that again ties in with some of the presentations I've given recently on predation. Um, predation is a really, really obvious example of interspecific competition, but also we have interspecific competition taking place at the same trophic level among the same guild of carnivores, for example. Um, this is a photograph taken by uh, my friend Dan Staler flying over Yellowstone, uh, where a wolf pack encountered a grizzly bear. Both species are apex predators in this environment. They both are directly in competition with one another for resources. And this is a, a very iconic example of interspecific competition, which I think, again, comes uh, into a lot of our interests, at least mine personally, because I work with large carnivores like this. And I'm fascinated not just about intraspecific competition, where wolves are competing with other wolves for resources, but also interspecific competition. Um, this fascinating subject, I think, is too commonly overlooked. It's often oversimplified, for example, when we talk about wolf reintroduction into Yellowstone and into other locations of Western uh, North America. Wolves don't just live in a vacuum with their environment. Uh, they engage and interact with a, a lot of other carnivores on the landscape, not just large carnivores such as grizzly bears and black bears and mountain lions, but also mesocarnivores like um, coyotes. Coyotes are ubiquitous across North America, and wolves and coyotes, uh, although on different trophic levels, have a lot of interspecific competition. And wolves can very quickly suppress or oppress coyote populations. So when you have a wide variety of species living together, you generally will have some form of niche exploitation and interference. So <clears throat> interference, again, I, I kind of just talked on that, and I'll give you some examples in just a minute. But interference is, is pretty obvious when you have two species or more on the same trophic level um, struggling to, to obtain and secure the same resource, which ultimately is going to affect the population of one species and the other. One might be more successful and one might be less successful. And it's possible that you could have uh, one species creating a limiting factor on the overall population growth of another species. Um, for example, again, wolves and coyotes competing directly for meat on the landscape. Although one is a large apex predator and the other one is known as a, a meso predator, uh, the wolf can easily. Um, uh, influence the overall demographics of the coyote population because as a larger apex predator uh, it's capable of of harassing and even killing and uh, dispersing coyotes on the landscape more efficiently than coyotes could interact and engage with one another through intraspecific competition and of course there's also indirect competition at an interspecific level um, where you have things like ravens and wolves uh, overlapping and also foraging off of the same resources. Um, there's been a lot of documentation on just how efficient avian scavengers like ravens can be at a wolf kill and removing meat from that kill. And in about 24 hours, if left alone, ravens can consume up to 60% of an elk kill which is pretty remarkable. Um, so you have exploitation of scavenging opportunities. If you have winter killed elk or winter killed bison, um, not preyed upon by wolves, but uh, potentially scavenged on by wolves or by bears. Um, you also have 
um, uh, exploitation by other scavengers and other resources or in other organisms in the environment. Now, to talk a little bit more about the behavioral side of this um, whole string of competition, I, I've got a couple examples here that I'd like to share. One being additive predation. Um, additive predation is something that I believe is important because it's not super common for us to see this in the natural world, but it's not unheard of. It does happen. Um, it's documented specifically in, in general watersheds or in local populations. And I don't think the public understands or appreciates exactly what it is. So I'm going to take a minute here just to define additive predation and talk about how this kind of competition can uh, directly influence and also indirectly influence a whole variety of species on the landscape. Um, generally, when we talk about predation, we have what's called compensatory predation, which is kind of our simplified caricature of, um, again, we'll use a wolf preying upon an elk herd. Uh, because predation is a risky business, wolves are going to gravitate towards the young, the old, and the sick. And by removing the young, the old, and the sick to some degree, um, they're basically culling out of that herd individuals that most likely would have died anyway. So wolf predation on this elk herd generally is not going to have any negative impact on the herd as a population. Um, compensatory being, again, just to reduce the herd by culling or killing the individuals that were most likely going to die anyway. Additive predation is the opposite. Additive predation takes place when you actually have predators negatively impacting a population and driving it into the ground. Basically, you're, you're um, causing your elk herd to dwindle because predation uh, is so high that there's not enough time for recruitment. Um, this can happen if you have what we call a predator pit, where we have a large number of predators on the landscape. Specifically, if you have a large number of predators that are different species on the landscape. So in central Idaho, for example, there's um, an area where the elk population has been dwindling because of a known predator pit. Where you have a large abundance of mountain lions, you also have a large number of uh, black bears in this case, and you also have a large number of wolves. And you have very few elk. And again, I often remind people that not all predators have big teeth. Um, sometimes prey populations can be um, suppressed because of uh, viral or bacterial predators. So you have disease that can be driving uh, a prey population down. And then with more predators than prey on the landscape, there's no opportunity for the prey population to increase because the predators are competing so aggressively with one another to get a meal that they're taking advantage of not only the old and the young and the sick, but also the healthy as well. So uh, when this happens, we sometimes have what's known as prey switching, where, for example, uh, a mountain lion that eats bighorn sheep might start to switch and eat more mule deer because mule deer become, uh, by default, more abundant than the bighorn sheep. And the bighorn sheep population might remain at low density because it is being suppressed again from top down as these additive predation uh, events take place. So this kind of direct competition, I think is, is really important for us to understand that there's a lot of complexities here. And again, there's no such thing as just a, a predator versus prey interaction or one organism versus another kind of competition 
scheme, we have very complex environments in which there's a lot of variables at play. Environmental variables such as forage, um, drought conditions, fire conditions. We also have a lot of other predators on the landscape, a lot of other prey on the landscape where even prey can uh, compete with one another. I think I've got it later on here. I'll get to it in just a minute. Um, then of course we have kleptoparasitism, which I also think is a really fascinating example of competition, interspecific competition, specifically at a, at a carnivore trophic level. And uh, I'll take this example from Yellowstone National Park, where if you don't have a, an understanding of Yellowstone and wolves, I encourage you to watch one of the other NetHab presentations I've given on wolf recovery in the Yellowstone area, but I'll quickly surmise or give a synopsis of um, wolf recovery. So in the 1920s and 30s, wolves and mountain lions were eradicated from Yellowstone National Park and the surrounding lands. Uh, bear density also was greatly reduced. Um, grizzly bears were almost completely eradicated from the region as well. And this is important for our narrative to appreciate and to understand. Um, but in the 1990s, wolves were reintroduced by the US Fish and Wildlife Service to Yellowstone. And as the wolf population grew, Coincidentally, mountain lions all on their own began to recolonize Yellowstone National Park at the same time. And bear populations began to increase as well. So all too often we focus on just wolves and their reintroduction into Yellowstone. Um, but unbeknownst to many, mountain lions at this same time were recolonizing the park and bear populations were increasing. So with all these predators on the landscape, all competing for generally the same resource, primarily elk, we had what was known as kleptoparasitism. And we still document this in a lot of places today. Um, kleptoparasitism is, is frankly just stealing food away from a different animal, whether it's the same species or a different species. Um, in this, carnivore guild of wolves and bears and lions, mountain lions are the most efficient predators. They have high kill rates, high successful kill rates, and they can bring down elk more efficiently than wolves and bears can. But they're solitary predators generally. And when wolves come in to a mountain lion kill, they often will chase away a mountain lion. And the same thing happens when a bear comes into a mountain lion kill. The bear will chase away the mountain lion, being bigger than the mountain lion. Um, this kind of kleptoparasitism causes the mountain lion to have to increase its kill rates. So mountain lions have to work harder and kill more elk in order to offset the losses that they're um, sustaining from the other carnivores on the landscape. So this is again a, a direct form of interspecific competition. Interestingly, um, bears, especially grizzly bears, are the top dog, you could say. They're the top predator in, in Yellowstone. And more often than not, they scavenge. And when wolves work together to bring down an elk, grizzly bears often will come in and they will steal the elk kill from the wolves. But contrary to what we see with mountain lions, where mountain lions have to then increase their kill rates to make up for what they lost, wolf kill rates on elk actually decreased because wolves hunting elk is a dangerous business. And it's very risky for a wolf that's generally 100 pounds to pursue and bring down an elk, which is 600 to 1,000 pounds even. And rather than taking the risk to go out and hunt more food, wolf packs show a pattern of generally waiting and watching the bears steal their meal that they worked hard for, and then going in afterwards and scavenging off of uh, the leftovers, the scraps at the table. So again, this just goes to show how complex competition can be. 
Um, predictably, mountain lions increase their kill rates when their food is stolen from them. But I think uh, counterintuitively, wolves actually decrease their kill rates when their food is stolen from them. And all of this form, again, kind of leads into what we call an evolutionary arms race of predators versus prey, uh, most obviously, but also not just predators versus prey or carnivores versus herbivores. Um, but again, species uh, just engaging with one another and interacting with one, with one another typically lends itself to an evolutionary arms race where you might have uh, an abundant population of bison and an abundant population of pronghorn antelope coexisting on the same uh, landscape. And through evolution, both species have had to adapt to their environment and adapt to the competition of shared resources so that eventually we get to the point where we're at today where um, pronghorn generally just consume forbs and bison generally consume grasses and sedges. So there's enough niche on the landscape for the two species to coexist, even though perhaps their progenitors um, back in deep evolutionary time did overlap and did perhaps consume the same, the same resources. Um, they've diverged to the point where they can coexist and Again, this is kind of this example of an evolutionary arms race. And of course, we have predation risk or even foraging risk uh, where predators and prey and also just animals individualistically um, as populations, excuse me, as populations have to adapt to um, uh, getting enough resources that they can and avoiding dangerous conflicts of competition wherever they can. Uh, this is a picture of a wolf 911 in Yellowstone National Park. Sorry, the skull is. Um, the bottom picture is a photograph by Ronan Donovan of a wolf on Ellesmere Island going after a musk oxen. Uh, but the wolf skull is a picture taken of uh, uh, taken from uh, a wolf 911 that had its jaw broken uh, in some kind of probably predation event, it got kicked in the face by an elk or something like that, and yet it had to, uh, it didn't kill the wolf and it continued to live on with a broken jaw um, remarkably. Again, there's just a lot of risk when it comes to competition and trying to gain enough resources to survive. Uh, my last example as I wrap up here today is just to highlight again, uh, the complexity of perhaps underappreciated inter specific competition on the landscape. I already highlighted that Yellowstone had eradicated its wolves and lions and really decreased its bear populations uh, back in the 1920s and then the 1930s. And because of that, the elk population in Yellowstone grew um, abnormally high. And when we look at the reintroduction of wolves, we look at how wolves played a part in reducing the overabundance of elk on the landscape. But too often, the simplistic narrative only focuses on wolves and the role that they played as an apex predator in um, driving that elk population down, which doesn't do justice to the complexity of the environment or to the wolf itself, which is not capable of truly driving a population as large as um, 20,000 elk in a single herd uh, down by a significant percentage. So it's important for us to realize that through interspecific competition, we have also grizzly bears and coyotes and, and, uh, and uh, black bears and mountain lions on the landscape. We also have to recall that we are animals, that humans are animals, and that our own predation patterns uh, influence uh, our environment. And in this case, in Yellowstone, outside of Yellowstone National Park, our hunting management policies and patterns influence the overall reduction of elk on the landscape. And then we have, again, interspecific competition with other animals at the same trophic level, where bison are extremely abundant, whereas they historically weren't. 
So after wolves and bears and lions had been eliminated or reduced in number, the elk population grew. And when wolves were reintroduced in the mid 90s, we also had mountain lions and bears coming back onto the landscape and humans were a part of the predatory equation by helping uh, reduce the overabundance of elk in Yellowstone. But since that point, the population of elk in Northern Yellowstone has remained fairly stable um, despite uh, not seeing an increase in our wolf population and also having removed a lot of the hunting pressure outside of the park, um, which was additive on cow elk specifically. And one of the questions that we're looking at now is, historically, there weren't very many bison in Northern Yellowstone, um, but now there are lots of bison in Yellowstone, uh, Northern Yellowstone specifically. And we have what's perhaps being recognized as a parent competition, where these two herbivores are perhaps directly competing for resources, but are um, namely grasses and sedges, but the predators generally prefer to take on elk rather than bison, um, because bison are just larger and more dangerous to tackle. So wolves typically will prey upon, and I can back up right here, you can see here, um, wolves generally kill over 80% of their prey is, is elk, um, and you compare that to bison, which is generally under 10%. Even though bison have increased in abundance on the landscape, they are simply more dangerous to hunt. And so predation of elk is preferred by many carnivores. And then you have bison and elk competing for resources. So the elk are um, being confronted at, by interspecific competition on two trophic levels. Um, which can influence the population as a whole. And this is something that we're looking more into. To conclude, I'll just say um, thank you for tuning in. This is one of the more sciencey kind of nerdy topics that I think is important for us to take some time to discuss to help us better understand the natural world. Um, very often we get caught up in uh, specific charismatic organisms that we tend to like, whether it's wolves or muskrats or geckos or whatever you like, um, it's important for us to truly understand and appreciate them by taking a step back every now and then and realizing that they belong to a very complex web of life. And competition is one of those themes that by a better understanding and appreciating competition, um, we begin to appreciate and even care more about those organisms that we have soft spots in our hearts for. So thanks very much. Aaron, thank you for bringing that um, complex topic to us. You really just illuminate so much with your knowledge. Um, we've got lots of questions for you, so let's just dive into those. Um, First, can you tell us what animal was on the initial slide in your slideshow? Um, I'll go back really quick. I had two competing bull elk. Maybe that's the question. This one right here is a, a young wolf. I think that this is the, the slide that they're probably asking about. So two bull elk in Grand Teton National Park sparring for um, the rutting season, getting ready to breed. Got it. Um, if there are more bears in a pack than a wolf, than a wolf pack, I guess, would the bears attack the wolf for food? Um, we don't have bears getting together in what we call a sleuth very often. So bears are solitary. Um, occasionally when there is a lot of resources available, such as a fish spawning event. So in those iconic nature show events where bears are gathering to eat spawning fish, or if they're gathering together to consume a dead carcass, perhaps killed by wolves, we generally will have um, a group of bears together. But most often bears are solitary. And by being solitary, um, bears and wolves kind of push and shove one another um, rather 
uh, opportunistically, but I will say that generally there's not a lot of mortality due to bears and wolves interacting. Um, occasionally wolves have been known to kill bear cubs and very rarely bears will take the opportunity to kill a wolf. They're kind of evenly matched. Numbers versus brawn. Got it. How does a predator know which prey is best for it to eat? That's a good question. And it has a lot to do with, I gave a presentation a couple months ago on foraging, which kind of answers this, but generally it's, it's all due to um, trial and error. So if you're a wolf and you see a bison, which is 2000 pounds, and you see an elk, which is 700 pounds, um, you might try and attempt to chase the bison, like in this picture, but bison are big and they're bad and they know that they're tough. And so they usually stand their ground. Elk on the opposite end, um, they're skittish and elk will generally turn and run, which encourages a predator like a wolf to go and, and pursue it. So in some cases, it's all based off of experimentation and uh, for herbivores specifically, it's trial and error through uh, an individual's life, but also through social learning um, to understand what plants are most easily digested and have the most nutrients. And in other cases, it's more obvious, like wolves pursuing bison, moose, and elk on the same landscape, which one is just easiest to catch without getting beat up yourself. Well, that makes perfect sense. Um, do you know what the ratio of wolves to mountain lions is? Um, that's a very broad question. So I don't know if they're specific I'm gonna asking near about a part maybe of the just world. Yellowstone ecosystem. Yeah, so there's more mountain lions in North America than there are wolves. Um, maybe that's kind of the easiest way to look at it. There's probably 20 to 30,000 mountain lions in North America. And there are probably, let's see if I can do the math really quick on this, five, 10, 15, there's probably, well, it's probably pretty close. Um, there's probably about 20 to 30,000 wolves in North America as well, mostly in Canada and Alaska. Mountain lions don't usually go very far in latitude up north. So, for example, typically we don't have mountain lions in Alaska, but we do have a lot of wolves in Alaska. Um, so there you go. <laughs> um, is it illegal to hunt animals in Yellowstone? Yes, it is, but it wasn't always illegal to hunt animals in Yellowstone, and some national parks still have hunting rights for specific purposes, such as Grand Teton National Park, just to the south of Yellowstone. Um, why are wolves hunted in large numbers across the U.S. when they are an essential species for maintaining balance? I've given a lot of wolf presentations to Natural Habitat Adventures where I go more into detail to answer that question. So I'd recommend people check out my natural habitat wolf talks, but I will say that wolves are not hunted throughout the contiguous United States outside of Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. So we have a large number of wolves in the Pacific Northwest, as well as in the Great Lakes states, and they are protected from hunting there. And wolves are managed um, in yellows, or excuse me, in Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana with different uh, hunting protocols. So they are important and I, I definitely want to stand by that, but um, they are also protected in a lot of places as well. Okay. I think we have one last question for you. Um, one of our viewers has talked directly with folks in Cook City who firmly believe that wolves are solely responsible for loss of elk herds. You did touch on this, but how would you counter that point? Well, firstly, um, it would depend on the situation. I, I deal with a lot of people all the time who don't like wolves and you kind of have to take that with a, a grain of salt. But I think it's important for us to realize 
the limitations of wolf predation. Again, I'd recommend people watch my other wolf net hab webinars, but wolves are not that effective as predators, especially when you compare them to mountain lions, for example. And this, oversimplif this oversimplified story of wolves restoring the balance to Yellowstone's riparian systems, I think has also done a disservice to the wolf um, because wolf advocates like to celebrate how the wolf reintroduction story um, saved the riparian systems in Yellowstone, which is not accurate as I touched on in this presentation and I've given a webinar in depth on that subject um, at an earlier date. But wolves are a key component of a guild of a trophic level. And it's important for us to recognize that yes, wolves hunt and kill elk, but the decrease in elk abundance in Northern Yellowstone, just outside of Cook City, had a lot of other factors at play, including um, human hunting management changes outside of the park, as well as um, increasing cougar populations, grizzly bear populations, and a whole bunch of other variables. So in a nutshell, I think that it's important for everyone, wolf advocates and um, anti-wolf folk, to realize that it's, compl it's complicated. And uh, the real story, I think, is more interesting as well, to recognize that all these species work in tandem, competing with one another and also supporting one another. Mm. Well, thank you again, Aaron. You bring so much passion and, and depth of knowledge to your subject. It's, it's always a pleasure to hear you present. Um, I'm gonna pass it back to you for closing comments. Thank you guys for tuning in and thank you again for all those questions. Um, I know that this subject was a little bit nerdy. It was a little bit dense. Um, I've been giving a few dense uh, webinars lately, but again, I, I do truly feel like it's important for us as uh, wildlife enthusiasts to get the big picture, to understand and appreciate animals more fully by attaching them to the ecosystem in which they belong. And this topic of competition is, uh, is one of those themes that uh, keeps the world turning. So thanks again for tuning in. I wanna thank everybody who tuned in as well. Please join us again next week for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out next week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.